many American offices are sitting empty. New numbers showing 94 million square feet of empty office space in Manhattan. That is an all-time record. Huge investors like Blackstone and Brookfield are staring down defaults in their office portfolios. Meanwhile, finding an affordable apartment can feel impossible, which has a lot of mayors talking. We have a great opportunity to change the mix of uses in the downtown. Make it easier uh, to convert unused office space to housing. So the thing about office to apartment conversions is it sounds like a great idea. Nobody's going to the office. We need more housing supply. Why not just turn all the office buildings into apartments? Not quite as simple as it sounds. Not every office building makes for a great conversion. Not every conversion should be done. Not every building should be converted. In some cities, the laws are making conversions difficult. It was about 3% of the New York stock that we, we saw as being convertible. And that took into account differential of price between offices and, and apartments, which has not actually diverged as much as people may think. But in places that have a lot of older office buildings, there's a lot of conversion activity happening. Some big cities are looking at incentives for developers who convert buildings into housing. Nobody does things in the real estate world out of the goodness of their heart. We have to find ways to either require or incentivize these things to happen. What's stopping cities from converting more offices into apartments? And what challenges do developers face when taking on these massive endeavors? The office conversion trend is heating up in a small group of cities led by Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia. We are right now in the Poplar Building in Philadelphia. The building was built approximately 100 years ago as offices and manufacturing space for Strawbridge's clothiers, the giant department store in the last century. This building is one of several conversions conducted by the Post Brothers. Physically, may have had some characteristics that people might think would make for a tough conversion. For instance, it's 100 feet wide by 400 feet long. That means lots of dark interior space. The first consideration for a lot of these buildings is about access to light and air. That's why you see in some situations real creative redevelopment of these buildings where people are driving a core into the middle of the building to allow for additional windows in the middle. We took a building that was a perfect rectangle, carved it into an E. It's extremely complicated, it's expensive. You also have issues of where does the plumbing lines run? And you know, it sounds silly, but you gotta have a bathroom in every apartment or more than one. And if you only have a single line of plumbing or a single area of plumbing, because think about the offices, the bathrooms are only in one part, it's gonna be much more expensive to convert that. Builders call this technique remassing, and it comes in different levels of intensity. The poplar in Philadelphia received a light touch. We have units that are 50 feet deep as opposed to the typical you know, 25 to 30 feet deep. We are able to make them work with things like uh, what are called borrowed light bedrooms or interior bedrooms with a light and make really attractive layouts even though the floor plate might not seem ideal. Converted apartments tend to be pricey, much like other real estate in the U.S. In a hot market where there's a lot of demand for housing and a lot of growth, such as Denver or San Francisco, that conversions could potentially address maybe 10% of the housing need. That still leaves the other 90%. And so there's clearly like a need to think bigger about how we're gonna build more housing. Back in Philadelphia, the typical household makes enough to afford about $1,300 in rent a month. At the Poplar, single bedrooms can rent for $2,000 a month. Then there are projects like the Atlantic, where units can rent for three to $6,000 a month. It was a 1920s Beaux-Arts office building. We finished the conversion in 2019. There, for instance, we made a lot of structural modifications. As an office building, it had old mechanical systems that took up basically the entire roof area. When we're making those major structural modifications, it's to allow for uh, really high quality amenities. The Post Brothers portfolio includes 12 buildings in the Mid-Atlantic with plans for expansion. We're generally 96% you know, occupied at all places and there might be one or two weeks where there's downtime between the old tenant and the new tenant. That's what we call frictional vacancy, so that's really the only vacancy we have. 
there's a very different story unfolding in office districts. Office vacancy rates are pretty high right now in terms of historical context. The highest that we ever recorded, and that was 19.3% vacancy rate on average. And that was a really stressed period. New York's hovering around 12, 13% right now. That's a bad sign for investors. Well, some of the office REIT stocks have been really hammered, down over 50%, just because of the back to work, which is not going as well as some might have expected. How the streets feel in downtowns has changed a lot in the past three years. Not all of those changes are permanent. It is necessary for downtowns and cities to address that perception. Though many offices are quiet, they're not completely empty. That's a challenge for developers. I think the actual vacancy status or occupancy status is really the single most important uh, prerequisite for conversion, much more so than, for instance, the physical layout, you know, the, the floor plates or, or the systems or anything like that. Um, if there's not a clear path to emptying out the office tenants, it really can't be converted to apartments. When a developer looks for an office to convert, they're looking for certain criteria. For example, older buildings tend to make for better conversions. But the typical U.S. office is newer, bigger, and not vacant enough to be converted yet. These are massive problems for city mayors. We have millions of square feet of unused office spaces that is right now ready to be converted into housing. This just makes sense. Office vacancies also affect government finances. New York City offices generate roughly $6 billion in taxes each year. School districts will tend to rely heavily upon property taxes. The transit authorities like MTA in New York will tend to rely a little bit more on property tax. New York has experimented with office conversions in the past. In the years after September 11th, a wave of these projects rippled across lower Manhattan. We looked historically, and going back to 2000, and, and the number of conversions we were able to identify that did happen in New York, there's 50-something of them, and it turned out to be about 2.5 conversions per year. Well, uh, there's no question that rule changes in lower Manhattan helped to spur uh, new life in that part of the city. And, you know, the, the result has been a success. The residential population has tripled. That created tens of thousands of new units and really turned the battery and that surrounding area into a residential neighborhood. The government's policies can determine whether or not these projects happen. In Manhattan, commercial buildings generally can take up more space than residential ones. That condition, and many others, can change the financial outlook of a project. So the number one issue in New York is zoning. Washington, D.C., for instance, they have kind of very technocratically thought out the zoning, and you can effectively convert any office building by right to residential. In New York, that's very much not the case right now. And unfortunately, in New York, the zoning is dictated at the state level, not the city level. So there's been a lot of fights with, you know, in New York trying to get this change. Um, there's a lot of people paying attention to the issue. This is what it takes to get it done. People are reading through 50,000 pieces of paper to actually get housing built uh, in our city. If we have zoning rules and other impediments which are keeping housing from being constructed, shame on us, especially when you are so seriously uh, seeing people suffering in New York City and beyond. In Philadelphia, a 10-year tax abatement brought more development downtown. This policy saved home renovators and investors more than $1 billion in taxes. But just over half of those breaks went to owners of high-value properties. If it was a conversion, you basically were taxed on the value of the shell that you bought, but not any of the money you put into fixing it up. So that's been hugely valuable. Post Brothers has two major conversions in the works in DC, where the local government also wants to increase tax breaks for downtown developers. That's Washington. I think that is, frankly, one of the easier markets. When you look at, for instance, the West Coast markets, San Francisco has the highest GDP per person of any metropolitan region in the country. Uh, office buildings there just four years ago were valued you know, north of $1,200 a foot. Four years ago, it had the highest residential rents in the country, higher than Manhattan. We don't think San Francisco is going anywhere or there will be a huge opportunity set in downtown San Francisco. Critics of these policies say they're unnecessary developer handouts. 
Supporters hope the additional supply will calm the housing markets in expensive major cities. The U.S. needs about 7 million more market rate homes at affordable price points for extremely low income renters. The vast majority of people who are eligible to receive housing assistance never receive any. The scale of the problem is much bigger than the resources that most governments at any level are prepared to dedicate to it. You know, there's 500,000 new apartment units needed in New York by 2030 in order to remain kind of an equilibrium between supply and demand. We only forecast 38,000 more per year going up to there, which will fall well short of that 500,000. And it's important that we enable this opportunity for the sake of our commercial office stock, and for the opportunity to create new housing. But we do project that over the next 10 years, we could create uh, 10 to 20,000 units of housing. Uh, and that is our best projection. But also we recognize that a lot of this is due to factors, will relate to factors that are well outside our control. Questions like interest rates, questions like an individual property owners' risk tolerance or building layout. So we know that there's real complexity here. Our rules are in the way and we need to fix that.